Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to University Hospital's Department of Medicine Grand Round Series. Thank you for your attention, these guys. Um, today, we are pleased to have Dr. Pratik Mendirada speak with us about updates in management of advanced melanoma. Dr. Mendirada is a new faculty member whose work focuses on not only clinical management, but also enrollment of patients into novel clinical trials that will improve patient care and outcomes. His specific clinical focus is on patients with underlying genital urinary and cutaneous malignancies. His previous experiences focused on the management of patients with various hematologic and oncologic issues and on how the medical narrative can help educate and empower patients to improve their outcomes when battling cancer. Lastly, Dr. Mendirada looks forward to collaborating with the faculty at the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center as we transform cancer care and develop new promises and therapies in the near future. So probably just as important, uh, his commitment to excellence extends beyond the medical environment. He um, excelled at Duke University with the Hemong Fellowship. With that comes becoming a Duke basketball fan. Uh, he's, he's exceeded and, and achieved great success, and we hope he can bring that level of success to the Cleveland area as well. Thank you. <laughs> Please welcome me in joining uh, Dr. Menderada. Thank you. So I'm hoping some of that Duke magic can work with the Cavaliers, but I'm not going to cross my fingers. So it's really an honor and privilege to be here um, to speak to you. I, I see some familiar faces, but I look forward to, to working with a, a lot of you. And if you ever want to get a real-world experience, uh, the inpatient experience versus the outpatient experience of what we do in oncology, my clinic is always always welcome, and it's really great to, to get that perspective also. So. Uh, I was trained in GU oncology and then was out in the community and then uh, uh, there was a need for developing the cutaneous program. So I've also learned this. So if you guys have any comments or advice, uh, please uh, chime in. But I'll do my best to try to give an update. And when the surgeon kind of is done with their approach for the patients with melanoma, what are the things that we can do? And it's really a, a rapidly expanding field and a very exciting field for us to talk about. So here are my objectives. Again, everything I do, I want to start off with a case. We'll talk about some background, um, immunological, molecular dissection, what are things that we worry about as cancer um, trialists, immunotherapy, talk about targeted therapy, talk about TVEC, what are some future combinations, and then obviously leave the floor to questions and, and comments. So again, everything I do is, is based in a clinical. So this is an example of a patient, 47-year-old, chronic kidney disease, previous heavy sun exposure, blistering sunburns presents as primary with atypical, irregular skin lesions um, with some bleeding at the edges. So you're in a melanoma talk, so it's pretty clear what this is going to be. Uh, as referred to dermatology, had a shave biopsy, confirmed melanoma. The things we look at is what is the depth, um, if it's ulcerated, um, and then the number of mitoses. Those are prognostic factors that we look at when new patients are initially diagnosed. He was tested with wide local excision and sentinel lymph node biopsy, no residual melanoma, and three sentinel lymph nodes were negative. So it was rendered, cured, um, and was monitored, and then five years later developed end-stage renal disease, had a kidney transplant, and placed on immunosuppression. Comes in the uh, hospital, office, whatever it may be, new bone pain, tenderness, and altered mental status. I promise I won't pick anyone on anyone during this, but uh, I, I labeled it for you. So new, new bone met. Suspicious abnormalities in the brain. So the diagnosis on a biopsy of the bone was consistent with metastatic melanoma. We checked for a BRAF mutational status that is positive. So we're going to try to answer all these questions as we go through my talk. What is the treatment? Do you resect these brain metastases? Do you radiate the brain? Do you radiate the bone? Do you start systemic treatment? If so, do you start with BRAF inhibition or do you start off with immunotherapy? So We'll do a quiz at the end to see if uh, you guys are awake or how well I did. So you have to start off with a background slide. So again, melanoma arises from pigment containing melanocytes. Remember UV light, A and B, tanning beds, and we'll talk about a little bit about that. But there are inherent genetic syndromes, which also increase patients' risk to develop melanoma. Immune dysfunction, and as the aging population, we're starting to see an increased incidence of this. As patients get older, we see this immune dysregulation, which then could lead to melanomas developing. Tattoos, um, patients who get local therapy, photodynamic therapy, 
all increased risk. We are estimating 91,000 new cases and about 10,000 related deaths. Um, the lifetime risk is about 2.5% and the average age of diagnosis is about 63. Again, remains one of the most deadliest cutaneous malignancies. And when people think of cutaneous melanoma, the key thing is not just making sure it's cutaneous because it, there are different melanomas. And this is what sometimes even me as a novice when I kind of learn is it's not all cutaneous melanoma. So each subtype really makes a difference because they have unique biological and molecular phenotypes. And you always have to remember there's a superficial spreading, nodular, again, more in the skin, but always remember the non-sun exposed areas. So those are the acro litiginous. The most common are obviously the superficial spreading, but we'll talk about the other phenotypes that make a difference, which are mucosal phenotypes, and then obviously the ocular phenotypes, because those patients have different molecular biology and they don't respond as well to the other systemic treatments that we're going to talk about. So this is a concerning slide. Um, there is a rising incidence. If you look at the lifetime risk, uh, going tracking from the 30s to the 50s, and then you see a rapid rise. Um, and when you look at the annual deaths from melanoma, obviously we're seeing not as rapid a rise, but we're starting to see some maintenance. Um, and the question becomes just, is this society? Is this the way we kind of have approached with tanning beds? Or, And I, I bring this picture up of, uh, and this is not dating myself, and uh, but this is how people used to go sunbathe, right? I mean, we used those are the kind of outfits they used to wear. You go to the beach now, you don't see this. You see this. Um, so the reality of, of suntan and sun exposure and prevention, um, you know, we have changed the way we've kind of approached this, and has that led to some of the incidents? And so uh, it would behoove me to, to interrupt to talk about a public service announcement and reasons to protect your sin. So we know the exposure to UV radiation in the United States, by 8% of all melanoma cases have been attributed to indoor tanning. So certain states have actually been more prohibitive about allowing indoor tanning. And again, this becomes a, at what point does health, government, social impacts make a difference? But this is something where we can easily be an ounce of prevention could lead to potentially cure. Um, we're talking about the increased incidence, and again, tanning and prevention and SPF. So regardless of whatever, uh, you know, you decide to focus on, these are things, simple things that you can be doing every day. Anyone with children, you can be telling your children, and you can be telling your patients just the prevention that can occur, um, you know, with the, these simple measures by, by avoiding sunlight, being on the right um, with tanning, and then obviously using prevention as needed. Um, so this is kind of an emerging trend when we're looking at, and this gives you some, how are we doing as oncologists? Not that this is a benchmark, but we are seeing a decrease in cancer, uh, I should say an increase in death, I mean, sorry, increase in cancer survival, decrease in death. And if you look at all cancers we've seen, um, and this has been tracking in a period from the 70s to the 77s versus the 2007 to the 13s, all cancers have seen a five-year survival rates gone from 50 to 67%. Where we made a difference, obviously prostate, which is screening, diagnosis, and that, that's, a, that's a, a red herring, but we are starting to see a significant improvement in melanoma. And a lot of this has come from starting to look at the molecular biology. And so what we clearly think is there are certain specific tumors that have significant mutational load. And this will become more important when we talk about immunotherapy. So the thoughts are, think if you will, if I laid the background, that cutaneous melanomas, the increased sun damage to DNA has led to increasing mutational load. And when you look at mutational load, we think that theoretically should be a correlate to response to immunotherapy. So the thought is that if you are secreting more DNA damage, releasing more neoantigens, that would substantially um, lead to increased response rates in patients with immunotherapy. And I'll talk about that. But it kind of bores out. And this is a slide we use in all our cancer talks. When you look at what are the breakthroughs that we've seen in immunotherapy. We've seen it melanoma leading the case, and if you look at the mutational load there, that's one of the highest. Lung squamous cell carcinomas, again, smokers, chronic damage, increased mutational load, significant improvements that you see with immunotherapy. Lung adenocarcinoma, same. Bladder, you see the same. But go along the lines of some of these lower grades, like prostate, breast, CLL, the response rates with checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy is almost next to none in these patients. So is there some inherent bias when we're looking at developing biomarkers, that mutational load may have an impact as far as response to treatment. 
So again, this led to the Nobel Prize, and you should never fall asleep in uh, your immunology classes because it's going to come back to haunt you. But the reality is this kind of laid the framework for really a revolutionary approach in how we approach patients with all solid tumors by using immunotherapy. So it's worth taking the time to kind of walk through this. So everyone talks about these CTLA and pd one and PD-1 inhibitors, but it's really affecting at two different things. So CTLA inhibitors, think if you will, you need to prime the immune system and then you need to have an effector phase. So they're really working at two different uh, key uh, branches within the immune system. So when you have an antigen presenting cell that presents to a T cell that needs to, if you will, prime the response. And so what you do is you have B7, C28, T cell receptor, and MHC class, and basically CTLA4 is almost like putting your foot on the brake. It kind of blocks the signal to activate those T cells. So if you inhibit that, that releases the foot of the brake so you can activate those T cells to, re to lead to a response. But that in itself is not enough because you need the effector phase. So once those T cells get activated, they can be activated all they want, but if they don't prime themselves or home themselves into the immune system where the tumor is located, you're not going to see a response. So again, same thing. You have a T cell response with MHC. You have PD-L1 expression on the tumor, and PD-1 is a, almost like an inhibitor. It's blocked there, so it's putting that foot on the brake. So think, if you will, James Allison and, and Dr. Hanjo run recently the Nobel Prize with elucidating this, this key kind of checkpoints that occur, and by developing inhibitors, so CTLA inhibitors, you can block foot off the key, those T cells can get activated and then be effective in leading the response. So you have PDL1 inhibitors like atezolizumab, duravilab, um, and avulumab, and then you have PD1 inhibitors like nivolumab, pembrolizumab, and then you have CTLA inhibitors like uh, ipilimumab. The key difference is the CTLA, that's hardwired. They move T cells into the tumors. When you look at adverse side effects, those are increased because it's not just activating in tumor, it's activating the whole immune response. So we'll talk about some of the side effects and toxicity. But usually patients who are treated with these type of therapies, after response, recurrence is rare. This is a little bit different than in patients with, who are treated with PD-1 inhibitors. That can, you can develop a resistance to that. It does not move T cells into a tumor. So back to when I was talking about the mutational load, we talk about cold or hot tumors, and that's the problem with some of these prostate, CLL, you can give inhibitors all you want, but you can't really effectively move those T cells into the tumors. You can activate them, but you can't necessarily move them in, and that's where we can see this um, resistance that develops. And you can also activate exhausted T cells, but the AEs are significantly less in these because you're really focusing more on the tumor microenvironment than activating the whole immune system. So that's kind of a, a how I think about the difference between CTLA-4 inhibitors and, and PD-1 inhibitors. Now again, when you look at treatments, it's really immunotherapy or looking at receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And it's really eye in the beholder. And this is where I was talking about different subtypes have different molecular phenotypes. So again, this is a common pathway. is what we call the RAS, RAS, MEK, ERK pathway. So what it is is basically we think a certain subset of patients of cutaneous melanoma have activation of this pathway. And if you could theoretically develop small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors that block these pathways, either at the RAF, MEK, or ERK, you can therefore decrease proliferation and lead to response rates. When you look at the incidence, BRAF is about, in cutaneous malignancies, about 50 to 60% of patients have this underlying mutation. NRAS, which is, again, more further upstream, it's important because if you have an NRAS mutation, you can block downstream all you want, but it may activate through other pathways. About 15 to 20% of patients have that. C-KIT is another thing that we can target with another drug that we use, a matinib or Gleevec, which has already been approved for patients with CML, about 2 to 6%. However, when you look at acral uh, melanomas, that, that incidence goes down significantly. It's only about 20%. When you look at mucosal, the problem is, is we don't really have any good targeted therapies for those because it's only about 3%. In your eye or your ocular melanomas, they don't really have any of these, and that becomes difficult as far as treatment because you can't use any of these inhibitors. So when I, as an oncologist, is thinking of the patient, it's not only just looking at do they have advanced melanoma, where did it come from, what type it is, what subtype, and I'm already thinking in my head, then that would make a difference as far as how I approach treating these patients immunotherapy or receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So I know uh, there are not a lot of oncologists here, so we like to throw these fancy graphs, but these are graphs that we see in everything. But 
these are kind of the curves that we use, Kaplan-Meier survivor curves, where you really kind of each tick represents time over patient was censured, and then you have follow-up. So that's what we're looking for, survival. The other things we look at is these forest plots. So when you start seeing a drug, if it's effective, you're trying to do a subgroup analysis to see is there a certain phenotype that's better, and then one favors treatment, one does not. So if you do a randomized trial with placebo, one favors treatment, one versus not. Then we look at these things called swimmer spot because response rates sometimes become difficult. So think, if you will, when patients develop a response, what type of response is a complete, partial, so we're just like you're doing a lap lane in a pool, you each as an individual patient, and you just follow them over time to see how long they're actively getting a response. Then you look at these waterfall plots, which are basically the percent change in tumor. So the thought is that you're getting, you want an objective response. And so what you're doing is you're basically plotting individual responses, things going up you don't want to see, those things are progressing, and things going down are responses that you see. And then the inflection point becomes a point where you see that 50% change one way or the other. Obviously, in this drug, this would be fantastic because almost all your patients are getting a response. But in everything that we do, right, what is always paramount? The things we want to tell our patients is, A, overall survival, right? That's what we want any new drug to show. Progression-free survival isn't always the best surrogate, right? So you can say progression-free survival just may mean on that first scan they have not progressed or they have progressed, which just basically means there's a 20 30% increase in tumor burden. That may not be a surrogate. The patient may not even have symptoms. So for me, overall survival trumps progression-free survival. Then the next thing you want to know is what is the quality of life, right? Does it improve patient's quality of life? That's what they want to know. Doc, will I live longer? Will it make me feel better, right? So quality of life is always important. Response rate, not as much, but we live in a world where cost becomes a difference, right? So we have to think financially also at what costs are these drugs that we're looking at. And then when we look at these PROs, what are patient-related outcomes? Pain, quality of functioning. You know, these are things that we need to be more innovative in our trials. So don't always focus on one, two, three, or four. You want to look at the whole picture when we kind of look at responses, when we look at So this is kind of just a quick overview of how I kind of look at patient, uh, patients and how I educate patients. I tell them a drug makes you live longer, improves your quality of life, cost benefits, what are the patient-related outcomes, and I think those are very helpful for the patient then to determine how to really make those next steps. So I'm going to date myself back when this is when I, and this was probably the reason why a lot of fellows weren't excited about melanoma because this was really the numbers we were looking at, and all we had was conventional chemotherapy. And if you look at these are proportion alive, and that's not a curve you ever want to show your patient uh, when the drop-off is, look out, almost 20% is within 12 months. Um, so pre-1998, there were basically approvals where we had to give our patients something, but they were all based on no randomized trials. From 1998 to 2011, there were no FDA approvals in the setting of advanced melanoma. The only drugs that we have were decarbazine um, and carboplatinum and taxol, which we sometimes use in cancers of unknown primaries. The average response rate was about 8 to 20 percent. The overall survival at one year was less than 25 percent. Median overall survival was 11 months. We were telling our patients when they were diagnosed with metastatic melanoma, see your oncologist, see your palliative care doctor at the same time. So this was the reality of the life that we were living. And again, like I talked about, those molecular things, the immunotherapy responses and those pathways and the receptor tyrosine has really kind of paved the way and really changed the paradigm with how we approach this. But we had an inkling even in that era that there was some benefit for, for immunotherapy. And the only immunotherapy we had at that point was high-dose interleukin-2. Um, response rates were not great, 16%. Um, Median of survival was a little bit better, 11.4 months. But if you look at that top of the curve, you see this kind of what we like to see is kind of this leveling of the curve. And there was a subset of patients, if they developed a CR, meaning you can get them through high-dose IL-2, 59% of those were durable. So we were theoretically teasing out a subpopulation that could benefit from immune-based therapy. The problem is, is it came at what cost? When you average, um, and you guys don't see high-dose IL-2, but... Patients were dying, patients were sick, patients were in the ICU. We would tell them you would pretty much expect that. And so obviously you were selecting for very biased patients. And if you look at grade 3 toxicities, um, you don't want to be seeing grade 3 toxicities at 40 to 30% in patients. The patients were dying from this drug. So um, if you had a Hail Mary, that was it. 
So this is the exciting thing. So you go ahead and from there to where we're at now. So from 2011, we have seen a significant revolution in how we approach this. And again, I break it really into immunotherapy and targeted therapy. I included all the immunotherapy. So ipilimumab, again, a CTLA inhibitor, three-year overall survival is now reported at 20%. It got its FDA approval in 2011. The volumab, pembrolizumab, two drugs, both PD-1 inhibitors. Now we're talking about a three-year overall survival of 52%, um, which is really unheard of in that era, and that was, those were both approved in 2014. Combination, Ipinevo, which is basically taking that, like we talked about, the mechanism why we would maybe use both, prime the immune system, and then enhance the effectiveness of the immune system with a CTLA and a PD-1, three-year overall survival at, at 59%. And I'll talk a little bit about this interlegional therapy, uh, TVEC, um, have all been approved. Targeted therapy, so BRAF inhibitors now have been approved. Combinations, DAB and TREM, VEM and COBE, and the most recent new kid on the block, encarafenib and binimetinib. Now the median overall survival is now up to 33.6 months. So as a medical oncologist, this is fantastic. I have all these things to dip into. But the reality is, is how do we choose, how do we find the right drug for the right patient at the right time, right? Which is what we're trying to do with anything that we do. So this is where I'm going to try to kind of tell you how I approach it. So this has been a, a nice kind of overview where they've looked at all the kind of phase three studies and they've tried to look at how do you tease out which specific approach do you use? And if you look at, these are basically overall survivals, and if you look at that tail of the curve is what we're trying to see for that survival benefit. We don't really know which drug is the most effective, but we think that the combination, the anti-PD-1 and the anti-CTLA, probably behave the best as far as the best outcomes. The anti-PD-1s probably are second, and then the third below are probably the BRAF and MEK inhibitors. But this is just taking, if you will, biases that are gonna be with no cross-trial comparisons. These are just taking individual trials and graphing them over time. So that's not enough to tell your patients to just tell you if we follow up trials over time, this is a combination that we're going to give you. So there's still no curative therapy, and we're still searching for other predictive markers for BRAF, clinical parameters, lab-based parameters, tumor, microbiome, and host-based parameters to help you decide how to treat these patients. So I'm going to try to walk through each of these drugs pretty quickly. So anti-CTLA, ipilimumab, again, it was approved survival in the second line and the first line with improvement of median overall survival. Um, compared to against, basically, at that point, it was compared to a vaccine, so it was against placebo or to decarbazine and placebo. Response rates are about 11 to 15 percent. Median overall survival is about 10 to 11 percent. We've looked at different dosing strategies. The FDA approval is for a 3 milligram per kilogram. Um, 10 milligrams, you definitely improve the response rate, improve overall survival, but you have toxicities. And, and the, we'll talk about some of those toxicities. The problem with immunotherapy is once those toxicities develop, they are lifelong and they are potentially catastrophic. And so as much as we think this is a home run, it's not a home run for some of our patients who develop the side effects. Uh, when we look at PD-1 alone, um, so these are treatment-naive na patients. These drugs have been approved, and these are basically looking at combination, looking at pembrolizumab versus CTLA. So, right, that's a question we want to know. Is there one drug preferentially better? So, in this keynote 06, basically that's what they did. They randomized patients to pembrolizumab, so a PD-1 inhibitor versus a checkpoint inhibitor. And it showed significantly when you look at the four-year overall survival that the PD-1s actually outperform um, anti-CTLA, increased progression-free survival, response rate, quality of life. And it also, all these studies in treatment naive include patients who are BRAF mutated. So it doesn't answer your question, is a BRAF mutated patient going to get better from a receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor? It just shows you that that response is also going to be found in patients who are BRAF mutated. And if you look at nivolumab versus your standard chemotherapy, again, it outperforms. So post IPI, so the thought is, let's say you give IPI first and patients are progressing. Are there any benefits for using these checkpoint inhibitors? Uh, we still believe, like anything, and in, in this is kind of a paradigm that we see in all our patients, your best shot at goal is usually your first shot. The best response rate you're ever going to see is probably going to be your first-line therapy, and that's why it makes it so important for us as oncologists to make that decision how we kind of do that. So post IPI, though, um, your only options were, at that time, chemotherapy. So we use these checkpoint inhibitors. We saw response rates of about 
27%, but better than chemotherapy. Overall survival better than chemotherapy, but the hazard ratio is only 0.95. Um, but there's a lot of crossover in these studies because obviously we didn't have anything to offer. So even these patients who had worse biology crossed over with nivolumab. So at least the signal is consistent that you can offer potential post IPI a PD-1 approach. So this was recently discussed where we're stretching this overall survival. And now we're talking, you know, this is unheard of, right? We're looking at following these patients over time and we're looking at 60 months and looking at overall survival of 34%. And these are just updated. And in the treatment naive, again, that first shot at gold matters. Almost 50% of patients at 48 months are still alive treated with checkpoint inhibition alone, which is, goes to show you there is a subtype of patient that can have a durable response to these therapies. Now, again, everything comes with, with costs, right? You look at aspirin, and it has side effects. Unfortunately, every drug that we give has side effects. The problem with these are immune-related adverse events. So as much as you want to rev up the immune system, you want to do it in a cautious manner to really effectively hit the tumor cells. The problem is you can get autoimmune going basically from head to toe. So endocrine, starting with the pituitary, you get hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, adrenal insufficiency, hypophysitis. When we first were giving these drugs, these patients would roll into the emergency rooms. They would tell patients they're on immunotherapy. They were in adrenal crisis and they were grossly mismanaged and potentially died just because your local community ER says, oh, you're on immunotherapy, is that interferon? Is that, they don't know. They didn't know what to give these patients, and these patients were dying, and, and luckily we've gotten better. Eyes, uveitis, uveitis, GI, basically anything, colitis, enterocolitis, necrotizing colitis, perforation, renal nephritis, skin, you can name it, it can all happen with these. Neurological, we've seen patients pretty much present with Guillain-Barre that we have to immediately plasma exchange these patients. And it can be pretty catastrophic, especially when we talk about patients with good response rates. And now we're talking about using these drugs in the adjuvant setting. So you're talking about patients who have been respected, who have no active disease, who then start these therapies and then develop a potential life-threatening disease. So this is the, the problem that we have in, in being cautious about who we use this. Obviously, hepa, uh, hepatic inflammation, pneumonitis, when you look at the timing, I think this is important for us, in, and if you're on any of our services, you're going to see patients coming in with these complications, unfortunately, because we are giving it in more and more and more tumor types. The skin peaks pretty early and then kind of levels off. The endocrine also, it's really the thyroid that peaks kind of early and then kind of you can see these delayed things. The hepatic is a little bit later that you kind of see, but the GI stuff can also happen pretty quickly, but this gives you a time frame of when these things happen. And we're still trying to tease out who are the patients, are there certain patients that have underlying auto antibodies or certain microbiomes or certain things that are going to make them more sensitive to develop these immune-related adverse effects? And are there different dosing schedules? Are there, do they only need a certain amount of inhibition that can do that? But toxicity, I do not take lightly when I'm counseling my patients about what are the treatment options. And then a good way to kind of compare, so if you're making that decision between an anti-CTLA versus an anti-PD-1, when you look at side effects, and this was a good trial to look at, because remember they were looking at when you're comparing first-line pembrolizumab versus ipilimumab, the side effects are a little bit different, right? With pembrolizumab, with our, PT, our PD-1 or PDL one inhibitors, fatigue, they get a lot of itching, those you can manage, right? Diarrhea, um, but the other kind of Adverse long-term side effects you don't see as much as they're a little bit more common with the with the IPI. Again, these are looking at any grade, grade three, four toxicities. You see pruritus, diarrhea, but they get more rashes that you kind of see. How can we predict those patients? Remember trying to kind of see. So again, looking at host features. So we know that patients, and this is, you know that walking in your clinic, right? We think that patients who have better performance status are of younger age tend to do better and get better response to checkpoint inhibition. A study just came out showing that sex really doesn't matter. There were some initial studies that were showing that females actually do better to checkpoint inhibitors. Don't, we don't really know the mechanism why, but in a long-term meta-analysis, it didn't sure to bore out. Again, if you're trying to tease out BRAF mutation status, that doesn't really make a difference because they both will respond to BRAF inhibition and immunotherapy. We think that patients who have baseline tumor sizes that are a little bit smaller and PDL1 expression would make sense, right? The thought is that if I'm blocking a drug, 
patients who have high PDL1 expression should do theoretically better to checkpoint inhibitors. And, and there's some signal, but if you look at the PDL1 negative, it crosses so that you still see responses. That's not the biomarker that we're looking for. So again, how do you tease this out? Who do you offer combination to? So this is the problem. We know that they both work as single agents. Is there a subset, and I gave you that slide that showed you that combination makes a difference. So this was a study which was kind of the study we used to make that decision. What they did is basically compared Nevo, which is the PD-1, ipilimumab as a induction combination and then maintenance nivolumab versus just nivolumab alone versus ipilimumab and the treatment upon progression. So really trying to tease out what is the optimal approach for patients with metastatic. And they were going to stratify based on pd one expression, BRAF status to see if that would make a difference one way or the other. So you do see that signal that I talked about. The overall survival, when you look at the, the median over, overall survival has not been reached, but if you look at their landmark analysis, which is going to be at 24 months, the combination does win 64%, 59% versus it be alone 45%. But that's not, remember, all, right? Because we don't want to know just does it work. The next thing we want to know is also is it safe. So when you look at objective responses, that's what you see. So definitely the combination makes a difference. But this is, this is what I'm talking about. So treatment-related adverse events. So when you go from one to two, if you take single agent grade three, four, treatment-related adverse events, which basically grade one, so we give you toxicities, grade one is very minimal, not affecting anything. Grade two is it's getting to a point that you talk about holding drugs. Grade three, they're in the hospital. Grade four is almost they're close to death, right? So you don't want to see that. So 16% with single agent nivolumab, versus 55% with combination. So you're basically telling your patients there's a one in two chance <laughs> that you are gonna get a grade three or four treatment-related adverse event with combination. How many of them had to discontinue therapy? Almost 36% of patients on combination had to discontinue therapy versus only 8% with Nevo. So if you're the patient, <laughs> what are you gonna do, right? So these are these nuanced conversations that we have in the clinic where uh, I know you always worry about us giving therapies and not talking to our patients uh, about end-of-life issues, but we do our best. But these are hard conversations to have, and we're blocked 20, 30 minutes in the reality of these are nuanced conversations. And some patients come in and say, Doc, you're the doc. Why are you having this conversation with me? Tell me what to do. Other patients want to know all this information. So this is a nuance of, I think, the art of medicine that really is something that can only be taught with experience, and, and, and especially during your residency and fellowship, Glean on the mentors that do it well. Glean on the mentors who don't do it well. And you find your own pathway, but it's really nuanced, these conversations that you're having in the clinic. So can PDL1 tease out? So we kind of approach it this way. In the patients who are PDL1 positive, the response rate, if you look at it, 65 versus 55, and again we're splitting hairs, but it's, it's about 10%. So in someone who's PDL1 positive, I feel that 10% benefit is not worth that significant toxicity. They're probably going to do well with single checkpoint inhibitors alone. That may help me. In the PDL1 low, that goes 54 to 33%, right? So that's someone that I may say, look, you may need both, but obviously having that educated conversation. This is when they're talking about how long do we treat? So remember that nivolumab we treat indefinitely. So these are things that we're getting into good problems to have. Let's say a patient's coming in for year four on their checkpoint inhibitor and saying, Doc, I love to see you, but this is crazy. I can't see you every two weeks uh, to get my infusion. We're starting to see that after two years, if you see majority of these patients, 86% remain without any progression. So the magic number that we are now using in our studies is probably after two years of therapy, you can probably stop. So. Um, we are seeing those patients. Um, but back to what I was talking about, toxicities. There are some patients where all you need to do is prime that immune system. So are our inferior outcomes seen in patients who discontinue therapies due to AEs? And this is an interesting study. So this basically what they did is they tried to look back at all those patients who had AEs from induction combination and looked at patients who did not and tried to see if they had any worsening outcomes. And 40% of patients DC therapy due to the AEs the progression-free survival was 8.4 in those patients versus 10.8. The response rates were 58.3 versus 50.2, so they actually did not really see that. So there may be some patients who, not that you want them to get an AE, but some
something happens to their tumor or their mechanism that actually, once you prime the immune system, even if they have to discontinue therapy, they can still have responses, right? So we're not making that nuanced conversation. I may say, even if I have to take you off therapy, here's a slide showing that you could still theoretically get a response. So I talked a little bit about immunotherapy. I'm gonna slide through receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So again, these basically work by blocking BRAFs. They're called BRAF inhibitors. They have shown they're better than chemotherapy, like immunotherapy, improved response rate, progression-free survival, overall response rate. They have different side effect profiles. So the nice thing about receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, once you stop them, the side effects usually go away. With immunotherapy, you can stop, and they mean lifelong steroids or lifelong thyroid replacement or adrenal replacement. Those are indefinite. So that's something when you counsel your patients. So they get dermatological side effects, fevers with some of these drugs, photosensitivity, and QT prolongation. What we've noticed is that actually when you just block BRAF alone, you paradoxically rev up through a bypass, you can rev up downstream AMP and ERK. So what happens is we started seeing when we did single agent, you all of a sudden got a rise in secondary skin cancers, almost 20% incidence of squamous cell cancers. So what happens is there's this paradoxical activation of MAP kinases so then it makes sense that if you would, you need dual combinations. So single agent BRAF was what we used to do, but then we saw all these skin cancers and we noticed that it makes sense. If you do a dual blockade with BRAF and MEK inhibitors, that would make sense. So what were the response rates that we showed when you do MEK inhibitors alone? Same thing, they make sense, it went work better than chemotherapy. They have different side effects, dermatological, CHF, ocular, they can cause a pretty severe retinopathy and they can cause uh, bleeding issues, but again, single agent, not as good, back to the same thing, what about combination? So these were the combination studies, so taking a BRAF inhibitor upstream and a MEK downstream, combining them, what you saw is you had significant improvements versus single agent alone. So the standard has no longer been BRAF or MEK inhibitors alone, it's tom combination. And we started noticing that when you actually com combine them, that MAP kinase activation goes down, so those skin cancers you weren't seeing anymore. So how do you decide between these different combinations? And again, these are more nuanced conversations about how to decide, but and usually it's, it's where you feel comfortable, but I look at where are the response rates and where are the major toxicities. So the best response rates that we're seeing are probably with this new combination with encorafenib and vinimetinib with 36.8 month overall survival that they're seeing. But the different side effects are LFT elevations, nausea, CK elevation, so it's just monitoring these things. But it doesn't really answer the question, the fundamental question that we're trying to decide is, you have a patient who's BRAF mutated, so those are the only patients that can get BRAF inhibitors. Do you give immunotherapy or do you give BRAF? So how do you decide? So immunotherapy, we have clearly shown in multiple studies, including BRAF patients who are mutated, if you look at the response with patients with BRAF, it's almost equivalent, if not better, Look at the response rate with combination, 68% versus 53% in patients without the mutation. So that's not gonna help you decide, right? A BRAF is not gonna say, hey, shunt down the BRAF pathway. You can still see responses with immunotherapy. We think in the BRAF mutated patients, we've tried to tease out what are the patients that are most likely to benefit. Remember I was talking about clinical or laboratory biomarkers. And the best is saying those patients who have normal LDHs have tumor size that are less than, uh, is that a good sign or a bad sign? I guess the... Uh, uh, and organ sites, uh, less than three. I, I can keep trucking along if you guys... Yeah, okay. Uh, so again, the same thing has shown that patients who are better risk probably do better with BRAF, but it doesn't answer the question. So this is a study that we actually have here um, open at UH, which is gonna answer that question. So this is a combination ECOG study. It's looking at patients with uh, combination therapy. And so what you're looking at, patients who are BRAF positive, never had any first-line treatment, and you're randomizing them to nipi, uh, nivolumab and nipilumab versus a BRAF mech combination, and upon progression, you switch. So that will really answer the sequence question, and we're enrolling patients here at, at UH, and I think it's a very important question because we don't know what the right answer is, and this hopefully will answer that question. Um, 
we do also think when you make that decision that when you give a BRAF inhibitor after immunotherapy, it's just not as effective. So we know that first shot at goal makes a difference. So again, when I'm sequencing in my head, my thoughts are also thinking about if I'm going to taste, test someone and give them immunotherapy, then give them BRAF, the BRAF probably does not make as much sense. So if you're going to give that BRAF inhibitor, it may make sense to give that up front. So this is something real quick. Um, this is a new novel therapy. So these are patients who have locally advanced disease, non-metastatic. These are patients we see. They have, it gets into the skin, it gets into the dermis, it causes problems. So this is basically a viral oncolytic immunotherapy. So it's a high-risk patient, and what you do theoretically is it's TVEC, it's a viral oncolytic immunotherapy. It's a genetically modified virus that basically tag with GMCSF, the tumor cells rupture for an oncolytic effect, and then that theoretically drives a systemic effect, which then can raise the effectiveness of cytotoxic T cells to then get into the dying cancer cells. So the thought is, not only do you prime the immune system and get a local effect where the tumor is, you could rev up T cells elsewhere and get systemic effects. So not only do we think this may make sense in patients with locally advanced unresectable local regional disease, could it make sense in metastatic disease, or could you combine this with checkpoint inhibitors to move the field forward? So when you look at the benefit, this was basically looking at versus a placebo. It was definitely significant benefit when they compared it to GM, CSF alone, so I shouldn't say true placebo, but you clearly show that TVAC has a role in patients with stage three disease, so locally unresectable. Not as profound, when you look at D, those are patients with just stage four more advanced disease, visceral, liver, or CNS meds. So there is something that has rationale, and these are pictures when patients where no surgeon is gonna do anything, and after eight months of treatment, um, you see dramatic effects just from local therapy. So. So we're just scratching the surface. I think we're, we're very excited by all these responses, but we need combinations, right? So when you look at these curves, you see there's a drop-off, right? So all these patients first, there's primary resistance, and then these other patients drop off, so there's acquired resistance. So we need to do better. Um, and this is really the cancer immunity cycle where we're looking at how can we do better. So we need to improve how do we kind of target ca cancer antigen? How do we prime the immune system? Chemotherapy, radiation, how do we present better vaccines, interferon, TLR agonists? How do we prime better other checkpoint inhibitors? How do we get the T cells into the tumors, blood vessels, anti-VEGF therapies? How do we create recognition of cancer cells by T cells, creating these chimeric antigen receptors? So people much smarter than me are working on this, and we're trying to kind of hone this pathways and see if we can improve the cancer immunity cycle. And really, I think it's Ways to keep it simple is just removing these checkpoint inhibitors, better antigen processing and recognition, trying to find ways to activate T cells, and, and that's really where the future lies. And this is a study that we have open here, um, and Dr. Hoyms actually presented this recently, but we're still enrolling patients, and this is a kind of a similar theme of, of that viral oncolytic virus, this SD101. It's basically a toll-like receptor agonist, and what it does basically is it activates plasmacytic dendritic cells to increase an interferon response and then also increase tumor killing by activating these T cells. And so this was a phase combination because we thought, what if you prime the immune system with these type of agents and then add a checkpoint inhibitor, right? So take your CTLA out of the equation because CTLA are, are toxic drugs. This is just a local drug. So you inject the tumor where they have injectable lesions and then combine them with a checkpoint inhibitor. So this was a phase 1B2 trial for both treatment naive so are there certain patients that up front you go with this approach, or let's say patients progress on the PD-1 agent alone? Could this drug or could this injection prime the immune system to then have a response with, so we included patients who were actually anti-PD-1 treated. And prior anti-PD-1, again, that first shot of goal usually makes sense. So the patients who had prior treatment, response rate was only about 19%. Um, Progression-free survival was about 16%. Um, at six months, but the treatment naive, which were only five patients, so take it for what it is, those response rates were close to 80%. So there is some rationale for using these combination approaches that were tolerated well, some mild flu-like symptoms and injection site reactions, and now we've moved this, we're actually looking to work with this pharmaceutical company to open a phase three trial in those patients post-PD-1 on progression. So 
it's a very exciting time and a very exciting approach. Um, and we're just scratching the surface to look at this. And, and what you eat matters. I mean, this was a, a, we're just scratching the microbiome, right? So we're looking at these immune responses, and they looked at that diversity of oral gut and microbes for patients who were treated with PD-1. So what they actually did is an amazing study where they looked at patients who were responders and non-responders, analyzed their gut microbiome to see if there were certain patients, and they actually found out, sure enough, the responders had a higher diversity in their gut microbiome than non-responders. So again, along those same essence that theoretically higher diversity of the gut is associated with improved response rates. So you know where this is going next, um, <laughs> transplants. I mean, they, they're just starting trials to look at fecal transplants in patients and, and how do you kind of get that response. So we're starting to see emerging biomarkers. I think we're stuck with what we have from a clinical lab, foreign status, LDH, BRAF, lymphocyte counts, immunotherapy. Again, we're not there, but I think this is the exciting time. Microbiome, obesity for some recent patients who are obese tend to have better response to checkpoint inhibitors. Um, sex, like we talked about, type of melanoma and previous therapy. So how do I put it all together? And again, in a patient who's BRAF positive, high volume disease, you need a rapid response quickly. I start with a BRAF neck inhibitor first. Second line, your options are IPI nevo versus single agent combination. I'm single agent PD-1. Third line, again, chemotherapy clinical trial. In a patient who is wild type, so I still think I lean towards High volume disease, you need a quick response, you get a first shot of goal. As long as they can clinically tolerate it, regardless of PDL1 expression, I do combination. Uh, and then second line is chemotherapy or clinical trials. In patients with low volume disease, not significant that I'm worried that I need a response soon, if they're mutated or wild type, I still go with single agent, usually checkpoint inhibitors alone. Then usually use BRAF or MEK. An exciting study came out in the New England Journal that there may be a subset of patients with CNS metastases. So what they did is basically everyone with CNS metastases, what do we do? We radiate, we resect, we gamma knife. But actually, in patients who are asymptomatic, less than three uh, metastases, less than three centimeters, not on steroids, they actually did a study where they gave them upfront immunotherapy and watched them. And the response rate that you saw in the braid was close to 80%. So you can spare these patients radiation, which is, uh, I don't know if they're radiation oncologists, but they will say they're never side effects, but these are real side effects in young patients, dementia, necrosis that are catastrophic, let alone surgical resection that leads to codification. So we're really changing the paradigm in how we approach this. And again, in local regional disease, I still think there's a role to resect, 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 and then these combination therapies make sense. So. My conclusions, um, I think I've kind of summarized this. The incidence is rising. We're understanding the biological underpinnings, and that's really changed the way how we approach this with BRAF and MEK inhibitors. Response rates are seen. We still have a lot of work to do. There are ongoing clinical trials, and I think combination therapy will hopefully you know, enhance. And regardless of one's field, please continue to educate about prevention with sun exposure risk, tanning, and UV protection. So. Try to end on time. Again, the same patient. So the way I kind of put this patient together, so he's a kidney transplant. So all transplant patients were pretty much excluded from any of the immunotherapy trials. We're starting to look at, can we safely do that? The problem is rejection. So when I'm thinking in my head, I kind of gave something pretty straightforward, right? He's BRAP um, mutated, I should say, brain met. Um, can't really safely give immunotherapy to transplant patients. So his first-line therapy would probably be um, you know, AP, RAF, MEC combination. So I hope that was helpful, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. This is really exciting. So from that, when I was in medical school in the <clears throat> mid-1980s, um, I did research in the summer in melanoma with a guy at the University of Colorado. Everything we did for patients made them worse. So it's just come, it's come a long way. So questions or comments? Yeah.
Right. I think it's been an evolution in my time, right? Because we, at first, it's get a response, get a cure, um, get a response, get a cure at all costs, right? But the reality is, is now, like you said, these patients are five years out, ten years out, relatively cured. And so I think you have to address survivorship and with our palliative care colleagues is looking at it really from, and there's a beautiful article in the New England Journal that talked about that survivorship is real and we are not recognizing that these patients have to be treated very differently, right? Because the anxiety is always going to be there. So it's the anxiety, the mental approach. Then what are the effects that are going from head to toe that our therapies have done? So cutaneous side effects, skin side effects, cardiovascular. These are young patients that have inherent endothelial dysfunction, so screening them for cardiovascular risk, other risks of other things that kind of, and secondary malignancy. So it's really kind of creating that culture where you work together with your colleagues to kind of not, and I think primary care, you know, we as a role would say after year two, three, four, five, go see your primary care, don't see us. But I think that's where we perform a disservice unless we're educating our, our primary care colleagues, these are the things to look out for, these are the secondary things, these are the mental things, these are the things just to deal with because cancer patients are unique and I think they need that continued care. It's not that our care should stop and I think that's what happens, right? Like, okay, you're cured or see in six months, but what are the intro things that are going to drop through the things? And, and now even genetics, which, I mean, to be honest with you, we do not do a good family history. We do not. And when we check now next generation sequencing, because it's easier to do that than to do a family history, but the reality is, is it has implications on patients. It has implications on future generations and getting that whole thing. So I think creating an environment where survivorship is valued, what are the things that we need to do, what are the things we need to think of long term, are all things that you highlight that, that we just don't do as well. But I'm starting to see that once we work with our colleagues and even giving an FYI, right, like someone let the cardiologist know. I had one patient who I was trying to get him a cardiac stress test because he was a Hodgkin's survivor, and the cardiologist didn't know that, right? And so because the patient may not even relate it. it I had that when I was 18. I'm now 40, right? Like so it's just communication and picking up the phone and, and simple things. That it's just keeping everyone in the loop that these cancer survivors have real issues. When I, when I was involved in there's a model where a one-time sort of intense sun exposure increase your lifetime risk. So like 13 year old gets a really bad sunburn from intense sun exposure. Maybe their, their melatonin goes high. Is that, is, that, is that model still? Yeah, it's still there. I still yeah. think, you know, it's, it's always surprising to me because what you'll see patients that come from the gamut of, you know, be like I, I saw one patient that same thing, she had heavy sun exposure. Had a had a primary lesion resected almost 20 years ago. Then was diagnosed like she came over the side. So everyone thought this was, you know, her gynecologic. Yeah, or something. So she had an ovarian cancer, but then started chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Had a complete response, and then there's just one bone lesion, and so we biopsied the bone, and it turned out to be metastatic melanoma. And so there must have been a combination, like you said, some sun exposure, mm -hmm. and then maybe the chemotherapy just weakened her immune, so the, her immune system was keeping that melanoma in check. Mm -hmm. And then we gave chemotherapy, and now her immune system, and now she's progressed in melanoma. So it, it's fascinating, and I think we're just scratching that surface. That's why I moved from Denver to Cleveland. Like, <laughs> Boy, the sun. There you and go. It's, it's <laughs> working so far. There you go. One last question. All of these checkpoint inhibitors and other therapies, and I'm going to say just in melanoma, and that's great success for a lot of the cell So yeah, I showed that slide that that, and I think this this it's 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 finding the tumors that are both hot, meaning they have a lot of immune dysregulation, and having those T cells, and this is mutational burden. So this is what we uh, we show all the time. So the thought is that you need neoantigens, you need DNA damage, you need things to be revved up, and the cold tumors like prostate, CLL, breast where we don't have a lot of that mutational burden, you don't see responses. So what they're trying to do is how do you do that? So our radiation colleagues will say they're looking at approaches, like in prostate cancer, radiate, 
right? You create all this badness slash neoantigen slash exposure and then hit them with checkpoint inhibitors. Or you give them cytotoxic chemotherapy. What happens when you give cytotoxic chemotherapy? Cells die, right? So you get this neoantigen exposure and then hit them with immunotherapy. So we're just scratching the surface of how to make these tumors hot or how to make them inflamed to then see responses to immunotherapy. But if you look at it, that's what makes sense, right? Melanoma responses, lung response, bladder responses, stomach has an approval now, colorectal has an approval now, head and neck has an approval, but once you start going further down, you start losing those approvals. So that's why I put this slide up there as a reference to just say, this is what we think in the cancer community is why certain tumors respond and certain, certain tumors not. I want to thank you for a fantastic talk. Really. Thank you.